What's up YouTube, it's Leo again. Today I'm gonna to be talking about the Canon R50, which is actually what I'm shooting this on right now, using a 50 milliliter lens, uh, millimeter lens, just like this guy right here. This is the 50, the nifty 50 for the EF mount, which is used for this guy right here. This is the T3i, it's what I've been shooting on for like the last 15 years. Um, and I'd say the three primary reasons I upgraded to the R50 are, it shoots in 4K HDR, and it has continuous autofocus for video, which is what I wanted to use it for is for like home videos and stuff. Instead of having like a bunch of videos and photos and stuff saved in my phone all the time or all across my storage on my computer, instead I can compress a lot of that sort of stuff down into like a, you know, three to five minute video that I can save for any special event um, and that I would actually watch later as like I scroll through my old video, uh, videos or photos on my phone and to look at my, to see my son at his younger years and stuff, you know, uh, and you know, kids grow up so fast. Um, yeah, the time just flies. And so I'd like to have something useful and memorable and like not just be a big clutter of files and be something sort of short and sweet. So that's what I got the camera for because it does a much better job than my old T3i, right? This guy right here. So, um, it really checks those boxes for me, but it, I've had two issues with it primarily. One is it overheats. The other one is the audio has a problem. So the issue with the overheating is some people, and I watched plenty of videos beforehand and stuff on YouTube, and some people have done videos on it, and they said that at 70 degrees or so, they were able to get you know 30 some odd minutes and then almost 40 minutes, uh, depending on if they were shooting 4K30 or 4K24. I tested it at 78 degrees because I can't afford to cool my apartment to 70 degrees or 68 degrees when it's like 100 outside. So I tested it at 78 degrees. I got about 25 minutes, 25 minutes at 4K30 and like just over 30 minutes at 4K24. And I was able to do something about it. So that's what this video is primarily about is if you have this camera or if you have really any camera where you're having overheating issues. Um, is I can do a tutorial on this camera specifically. I mean, it applies to everything, but they're all disassembled a little bit differently. And all I was, had to do was remove the back cover and then remove the plate that's underneath the back cover and then put some thermal pads. So I put a thermal pad on the processor, another thermal pad on the RAM. And so that um, made contact with the metal plate that was in there. And then between the metal plate and the back cover, I put another thermal pad. So at the same temperature nowadays, I can get um, 33 minutes of 4K30 and almost 50 minutes at 4K24. And so a pretty substantial upgrade, especially when you consider that before, if I say ran 4K30 for 25 minutes and overheated the camera and then shut it off, I'd, if I waited like 10 minutes and turned it back on, I could get another few minutes out of it, literally just a few minutes. Um, where now I could turn it off for 10 minutes and then be ready to go for practically 30 minutes again, which makes it infinitely more useful for me. The camera already has an hour recording limit as opposed to like my old T3i, which only has about a 10 minute recording limit. Uh, it's, it's really not a length, uh, it's file size, uh, limited. So about 10 minutes up to as much as 13 minutes is what I've seen like the max in my use so far, um, is what I was able to get out of the T3i. But this is supposed to have about an hour recording limit. Um, and it just can't get there if it's overheating. And especially like you're not going to always have your room at 70 degrees and you're not always going to be indoors and sometimes it's going to be hot outside. And so doing those tests at 70 degrees, I think is a little less representative of real world use in warm scenarios. So I thought 78 degrees, I'll try it. Um, I also tried it with my door open when it cooled down outside, I, I opened my patio door and set the camera just on the threshold there with the, the screen still closed. So 78 in my apartment, 70 outside, so somewhere in the lower 70s probably um, is what the camera was exposed to. And at 4K24 HDR, I could run it endlessly. And it like the, the temperature marker did come up saying like, hey, the temperature's getting warm, but once it fills up that meter, that means like it's totally hot and you need to turn it off or it turns off on its own. It, it didn't get there. It was still a few marks from it. And then um, after an hour, and then at 4K30, I can record nearly 50 minutes. So 
I think it's a pretty huge improvement, especially when you consider how quickly it cools down. Of course, there are other things to consider when you're like comparing the R50 to something like a T3 or really any, an M50 even, when you're comparing like an EF mount camera and an RF mount camera. One thing is um, the RF lenses are more expensive. There are not a ton of um, uh, inexpensive or more budget friendly, um, useful lenses. Where like with the EF, you know, the Nifty 50 is about 120 bucks. On the RF, it's like $190, I think. Um, the kit lens, right? This is the kit lens right here, which is an 18 to 45, not an 18 to 55 that you get on the T3. Um, you can buy it for MSRP of $300, which is outrageous, realistically. Um, or you can, you know, pair it up with your camera as a kit and you pay like $120 on top of your camera to get this lens, which is not a terrible deal. I, I would say it's, it's worth it. Um, you can also get one used when they pop up for a little under $100, but you can get this one used for about 40 bucks, sometimes less, which is what mine is. I bought mine for 40 bucks used because I accidentally dropped my original one and broke it. Um, and then you've got something like this. This is the uh, 55 to 250. And it's really, really an awesome lens. Um, it's not, I mean, it's not cheap. It's not super expensive. I got a great deal on it from a friend of mine. Um, I think he sold it to me for like 60 bucks. It's a $300 lens. So he definitely cut me a great deal. Uh, the other issue I have with the R50 is the sound. So regarding the sound issue, sometimes it ha has this clicking sound in it. And I've read um, through many forums and stuff, people will say that it's actually the autofocus that's causing that sound. Um, and it just sounds like click, 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 click throughout the entire duration of a video clip. And it doesn't happen in every video clip, but it does happen in some of them. And of course, that's going to ruin that entire clip. Um, the T3 sometimes doesn't record any audio at all, which is very annoying as well. Like some of my clips, even though I've done nothing to the mic, even though I've tried different mics, even though I've tried different cables, um, sometimes it just doesn't have audio. The R50, on the other hand, sometimes makes noise. And this is true with the built-in mic as well as with a shotgun mic, whether you mount it or you don't mount it. So that's been an unfortunate, a little bit annoying. Uh, and so a solution to that for me, my suggestion is get a sound recorder. So this is a sound recorder. I know it's like trying to focus on my face because I didn't put that other mode on. The product showcase mode or whatever the heck. Um, anyway, this sound recorder is, I think I got it like 40 bucks um, on sale at Best Buy a few years ago. And it has plenty of internal storage to record raw audio or lossless wave form. Um, and plenty, of, yeah, plenty of internal storage. The battery lasts super long. It's rechargeable. It has a USB that you just slide the thing out and plug it in. And that's how you transfer your files as well as how you charge it. You can plug a lav mic into it. You can plug dynamic mics into it as long as it's something that doesn't require phantom power. And if you do need something like that, you can buy a power source for that microphone anyway and then still plug it in. Um, otherwise, you know, you don't have to. It still has its own built-in stereo microphones on top. It's got a mic on the left and a mic on the right, and it shows you your audio levels as you're talking. So you can always see it. And so the thing is, you could 3M mount this to... There's, the, the camera itself has uh, a hot shoe cover. So like this one, I don't have a cover on it anymore. I don't know where it is. But this hot shoe right here where you plug in a lot of different accessories like flashes and mics, um, you'd put it right here. And uh, the, the cover, it comes with a plastic, like a soft plastic cover. Um, and you can three, put some 3M tape on that thing and stick this bad boy on there. And then you there you have reasonably good audio I would say substantially better than like shotgun mics that I've tried, at least like, you know, store bought $100, $150 shotgun mics that you could put on top of a camera and you could do it at 40 bucks with internal storage. And then you just sync it up later in post, which you're going to need to do anyway, because even when you play back audio that's recorded from the camera, sometimes you may see that it's not perfectly in sync. Um, this is sort of the nature of the beast, but, but, um, this camera, the T3, I'm actually I'm actually gifting it away to to my niece, and I'm giving her the kit lens, of course, and I'm giving her um, the 55 to 250, as well as the 50 millimeter, and some cheap polarizers. Like that's a cheap polarizer that's on there. Um, 
as well as uh, a couple batteries and uh, a charger for those batteries. Um, so it charges both of them at the same time. So she's gonna have a total of three batteries, which is enough to like run it endlessly, as long as you don't run out of storage space. Um, she's of course taking a 128 gig card with her. Um, sorry for my creaky chair. The only other thing I bought for this thing is actually these real cheap, um, who makes these things? KNF Concept um, uh, variable ND filters or neutral density filters. Um, the purpose for these, like if you're if you're new, if you're watching an R50 video, my suspicion is that you're new or newer, right? So either totally a beginner or sort of a hobbyist. Um, you're definitely not considering this camera if you're like an ultra professional as your main camera or anything like that. This might be like a backup camp for you or something. Uh, in any case, if you're new and you're unsure of what I would need this for or why I, I think it's very useful is um, if you're going to shoot daytime video, which is really what it's for in my opinion. I mean, you can do it for long exposure photos as well for like flowing rivers, waterfalls, clouds, tree swaying, stuff like that. What I use it for is for video. So it, you might notice that at 30 FPS or 24 FPS in your videos, it seems really choppy. It looks like stop motion because it essentially is because your frame time is way too, your short, your shutter, uh, your shutter speed is way too fast. And so it takes a very short amount of time to take photos. So let's say I was moving my hand across the screen. I'm sure right now you can see it's kind of blurry as it moves across. I know apart from it, like being out of focus, but I mean like the motion of it is blurry, right? And the reason for this is I have it set to uh, 1 50th of a second is my shutter speed. And right now it's uh, 24 FPS. So it's about double that. Right. And so what that means is that like at every frame, right, you get the motion from one frame to another. You have half of that motion being blurred and then it starts at the next one where if the shutter speed is way too fast, it like takes a perfect freeze frame at every location. So the hand looks really sharp or like the locations of it look very sharp along the way. And that's why it looks like stop motion, because that's how stop motion works. You take a bunch of still images and then put them together in a sequence so it looks like a video, but there's no motion blur. And so if you shoot it at what's called the 180 degree rule, um, you can get this sort of what, what's the cinematic standard for, for motion blur. And so if you're outside and it's super bright, you won't be able to do that unless you use a variable ND filter, the limitations of ISO shutter speed and uh, aperture. So this is what I'd recommend if you're just starting out right outside let me hopefully these tips have helped you and uh thanks for watching i'll see you guys next time